Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Schmaltz and I'm editor in chief of the Journal of Global Catholicism. And this is part of our continuing series of interviews with scholars in the field of Catholic studies. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce William Cavanaugh of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, and also professor of Catholic studies at DePaul University. So many thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Matt. Yeah. Um, and so first, tell us something about your intellectual journey, how you got to DePaul. Oh, gosh. Um, so I went to Notre Dame as an undergrad, intending on majoring in chemical engineering, and I got hooked on theology. So um, <laughs> one of my professors, I was going to go to law school after getting a theology degree after I changed. And one of my professors said, lawyers are a dime a dozen, go get a degree in theology. So I wow. did. Um, between my master's and PhD, I spent a couple of years in Chile on a volunteer program um, with the, the Order of Holy Cross, uh, working in a, on a cooperative building project in a poor area of Santiago, Chile under the military regime. Okay. So that's, that's kind of my uh, experience with uh, global uh, Catholicism was a, a couple of years I spent uh, in Chile and then um, got a, a PhD at Duke and, and began teaching. Okay. And um, also, hasn't your work in Chile produced a publication? Uh, yeah, that's right. That was the, it was um, my dissertation, which was my first book is called Torture and Eucharist. And it's uh, about the church's response to human rights abuses under the military regime. Uh, and I actually, when I came back from Chile, I worked at the law school at Notre Dame for about six months uh, with the archives of the Vicariate of Solidarity, which had kind of cataloged all the human rights abuses under the military regime. So that experience kind of gave me my materials for, um, for the dissertation, which became the, the first book. Um. Yeah, and um, for those of you listening, it's a book that comes highly recommended, uh, certainly by me. So you ended up at DePaul, and so tell us just a little bit about DePaul. Yeah, so DePaul is, uh, uh, it calls itself a Catholic Vincentian Urban University. Okay. Um, it was founded in 1898 by the Vincentian Order, so the, the followers of St. Vincent de Paul and Louise de Marillac. And um, from the beginning, it's been kind of the poor, the poor kids school, um, as opposed to the Jesuit school. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, Got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but DePaul, from the beginning, has been kind of a working class school. We still, nearly 40% of our students are undergraduates, our first generation wow. college goers. And the DePaul has always been very uh, inviting. They were very welcoming to Jewish students when the University of Chicago and Northwestern had quotas for Jews and so on. Okay. So um, the, the kind of social justice aspect has been there uh, from the beginning. There aren't very many Vincentians left. And so um, the Vincentian character is now carried on mostly by lay people and people around Notre Dame tend to talk about Vincentian much more than they do about Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, the the Catholic um, identity of the of the university um, has been, I think, um, diminished, and so and that's one of the reasons why the Catholic Studies Department was created uh, in 2010, uh, and why the center was created just a, a little bit before that. Okay, can you uh, share a little more about that, uh, particularly about the center, but also Catholic Studies, and you know how it was started and also conceptualized? Sure, so um, the, the Catholic Studies program came about sometime in the 20, uh, the, the 2000s, okay? I, I'm not sure when, I got there in 2010. Um, and uh, it, it was an attempt by Catholic faculty in various departments to kind of do something Catholic at DePaul. Um, there wasn't much Catholic. You can still today get through to Paul without much exposure to Catholicism at all. Mm -hmm. There's a religion requirement, but you can satisfy it by taking one course in 
Buddhism and another course in business ethics. Mm -hmm. So um, they started a Catholic studies program and then it became a, a department in 2011 uh, uh, or 2010. And that's when, when I uh, came from the University of St. Thomas. The, the center was started, I think a couple of years earlier than that in 2008, maybe. Um, and the idea was to kind of capitalize on uh, the broad kind of uh, international uh, outreach uh, that DePaul was trying to emphasize and the kind of fit with the, the character uh, of DePaul as a, a Catholic university. Okay, and so let's talk a little more about the center. Um, you know, how is it structured? What kind of work does it do? And so forth. Yeah, so we have three faculty and two staff. One of the staff is half time. Mm -hmm. um, we host visiting scholars each year from the global south. We publish a book series, uh, Studies in World Catholicism, which is largely um, volumes that come out of conferences that we do. We have a podcast series called Near and Far. Um, we have an annual international conference, World Catholicism Week, which starts this evening, actually. Oh, wow. Uh, each spring, uh, uh, youth, is, youth and young people is the subject for today, but each World Catholicism Week kind of gathers people from around the world, uh, from every continent, uh, to talk about one particular subject. Um, we have other events, lectures and roundtables and so on throughout the academic year. Uh, we have a free video library of recordings of our past lectures and conferences. And we have um, the African Catholicism Project, which is uh, an attempt to kind of create a network of scholars in Africa working on African uh, Catholicism. Uh, and we've actually got a conference in Nairobi in July where we're gonna launch our um, handbook of African Catholicism, oh, this massive 800 page reference book, which is being published by Orbis uh, Press. So we do all of that. Um, uh, with the uh, cooperation of a lot of people and a lot of a lot of good uh, goodwill. Yeah. So, given all of that, I mean, uh, what would you say are the particular strengths of the center as as it's developed over the last couple of years? Um, yeah. Well, um, I mean, one of the things that we do well, I think, is we're a resource for scholars and pastoral agents. Uh, around the world. So some of the things that I mentioned there, uh, the providing opportunities for networking, for example. Um, so we're gonna gather scholars from around uh, Africa uh, in Nairobi uh, in July. And a lot of African scholars just don't have the kind of opportunities. They don't have travel budgets. They don't have an annual AAR, uh, American Academy of Religion, like we do uh, in the US. So this is an opportunity to kind of network. We've set up kind of mentoring relationships. So for the chapters of the handbook, uh, a senior scholar worked with a junior scholar. Uh, we have fellowships. We've sponsored PhD students uh, at uh, DePaul in addition to the more senior scholars. Uh, we have books and podcast series and so on. So we think of ourselves as kind of a research uh, center that is a resource center for uh, people in the in the global south. I think that's that's one of the things that we do well. Yeah, and given those resources, I mean, what particular intellectual or theological issues do you think your center is is best equipped or uh, to address or most interested in addressing? Yeah, I mean that's hard to say. We don't have a, a kind of particular agenda. Mm -hmm. I think some centers say, okay, we're going to spend the next five years working on this set of um, right. this set of, uh, of questions. Um, we want to serve both the academy and the church, and we don't. We try to let our partners uh, in the global south set the agenda. So, for example, we have a partnership with the, the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro, and they suggested that uh, Helder Camara is not very well known in. Uh, the U.S. and Dorothy Day is not very well known in hmm. Brazil, and so we had a conference on Dorothy Day in Rio de Janeiro, and we had a conference on Helder Camara in uh, Chicago, and uh, I thought that was a, a good way to cooperate, but we try as much as we can to be aware 
of our position as you know having resources and we we try to let the the people in the the global south kind of set the agenda um, and so we take different suggestions for uh, different topics of interest but the our recent world catholicism weeks have been on uh, youth and young people again starting today uh, health care Nonviolence, women's leadership, uh, ecumenism, Pentecostalism, uh, ecology. Uh, those are those are some of the things that we've we've worked on, and each one of them has a, a corresponding volume in our book series. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that anyone involved in you know working in the Catholic Academy has to face is the politicization of Catholicism, particularly, you know, in this country, um, I would think, um, most specifically. So how do you navigate that um, in your own work? Well, I mean, that's one of the great things about working with the church globally is that you kind of step out of the dynamics of American politics and the culture wars, you know, um, uh, striving to gain influence over policymakers to mm -hmm. get the bishop's agenda into law. Um, that really doesn't mean much in places where there isn't much of a functional government, you know, a lot of places in Africa and so on, where the church kind of, you know, in, in some ways substitutes for the, the yeah. government it provides, is the, is the main provider of healthcare and education and, uh, and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, occasionally we get uh, a speaker that says something which is disagreeable to an audience member. Um, but uh, I think we, in, in some ways, we have the advantage of just sort of stepping out of the, the usual space of controversy. Um, and, and we think of our job as, uh, part of our job anyway, is to help the US church have a broader view. So our concerns here are not those uh, of the, church as a as a whole mm -hmm. so you know from your experience in chile onward um what has your involvement in issues surrounding global catholicism taught you um gosh yeah um um i think one of the things that i've learned is how quickly the stereotypes uh, dissipate, you know, um, I mean, the more that I get to know people from around the world, the more I tend to think of the global South less as just kind of one big hole, you know, we, we kind of uh, had this moment about 25 years ago where the church in the North kind of discovered the church in the South, right. you know, uh, Philip Jenkins book on the, the next Christendom, and suddenly everybody was talking about how the you know, the center of gravity of the church worldwide had shifted from the global north to the global south. And with that kind of, you know, sudden sort of realization, there were, you know, certain stereotypes. The, the church in the south is conservative on sexual matters, but progressive on political matters. Um, you know, and in general, there's a kind of vibrant church in the south and a moribund church in the north. Um, but the more uh, the more I study it, uh, and the more I meet people and and travel, um, the, the the stereotypes, if they don't break down entirely, they're complexified. You know, there's a, a greater diversity today, I think, in um, uh, attitudes towards sexual ethics in the South than, than there were, um, uh, you know, in in recent decades. I think um, the church in Europe is not dead. Um, I think that was premature. Uh, the church in Africa is not without serious problems, even though it's kind of held up as this uh, great um, uh, representation of growth and vitality, which it certainly is. Um, but it also has serious problems, one of which I think is a coming sexual uh, abuse uh, sure. crisis, which is going to match that of uh, of the church in the north. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I teach a, a course on intro to world Catholicism and uh, to my undergraduates. And, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to see the students kind of rediscover 
Catholicism through the lens of elsewhere. So it kind of helps us break out of our small uh, dynamics uh, that, that we usually think of, of Catholicism. But um, one of the things that I have been impressed by, I guess, uh, just to, to make a very broad generalization, is just the, uh, the dynamism and the diversity of Catholicism uh, around the world. Um, and one of the things I do in that class actually is thanks to you and uh, your work there, you're in Tom Landry's work at, uh, at Holy Cross, the Catholics and Cultures website, every class uh, period in that class begins with a student or two making a presentation, yeah. uh, just a minute or two from the Catholics and Cultures website, something they thought was fun and interesting, pick mm -hmm. a country, pick a thing, and just talk about it for two minutes. Uh, and that I think just gives uh, the students and me uh, uh, a sense of the kind of breadth and, and vitality of the church around the world. Yeah. Are there any particular theological issues uh, for you as a theologian that, you know, this, I don't want to say encounter with global Catholicism, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there. This encounter with global Catholicism has raised for you or that you find particularly interesting. Theological issues? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess for me, the issue that I keep coming back to more and more in uh, in the class that I teach on this uh, is uh, this, the centrality of Christ and the question of suffering. Mm. Um, that uh, one of the things that makes Christ concrete and not abstract to the students is this kind of connection with um, uh, the sufferings uh, of Christ and the and the this very strange idea of a God who identifies with uh, with those who suffer, and that um, I think in, in a lot of what we read that kind of comes across as being central to uh, the experience of a lot of people, a lot of Catholics in the uh, in the global South, and so that um, I think has been uh, for me one of the um, central kind of theological issues uh, that I face in, in teaching that course and in encountering people from around the world. One of the issues that I've faced is how you define what Catholic is, you know, what mm -hmm. goes into the basket, you know, and is Catholic a normative term uh, when you use it uh, academically or is it simply a descriptive term? Um, so how do you sort of wrestle with that or, or engage that in terms of sort of what you include and what you don't include, whether it be in a course or in the work of the center as a whole? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I guess it's both uh, descriptive and normative, right? Okay. I mean, um, the Catholic Church is, I often tell my students, the, the first truly global organization and continues to be today, probably the only truly global grassroots organization. Mm -hmm. And so um, that it, to me is a, I mean, that's a, a kind of descriptive uh, reality. Um, but, but with that, of course, then come certain uh, questions of, of normativity and what gets included as Catholic and, and what doesn't. And of course, we have a magisterium to help us sort through uh, all of those questions. There, there are, of course, some limits to uh, diversity. Um, but the idea that uh, we read um, Shusaku Endo's novel, Silence, and uh, in the preface, he talks about the Catholicism as a symphony where it's important to kind of get notes being sounded by uh, everyone throughout the world, right? It, it's there, that there's no culture that's, that's excluded from it. There's, there, there's uh, um, uh, something, everybody has something to add uh, to the symphony uh, that is Catholicism. And I like that uh, as, a, as an image. Uh, but one of the exercises that we do in the class is trying to, is taking up certain questions of enculturation 
and trying to uh, determine what's a good enculturation and what's a bad uh, enculturation. You know, can you use rice cakes and sake to, to perform the Eucharist in Japan? Um, uh, is the, um, the uh, it, it, ordination of women, is that uh, a, a proper in, enculturation? Um, all of these kinds uh, of questions, and I try to make them very aware that enculturation is not just a problem for other places. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we tend to think that we don't have culture, right? We're just, we're just neutral and that other people have culture. But I give them examples of enculturation uh, of, you know, Jesus in American culture, uh, including mm -hmm. a great picture of Jesus shooting, uh, teaching a little kid how to shoot a gun. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> okay. well, I'm so just to make them here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know if that answers your, your question, but those, those, those are some of the things that, that I wrestle with. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us uh, this afternoon. And, um, you know, the work you do at the center is just really wonderful. And so thank you for sharing it with us. Oh, my pleasure, uh, Matt. And, and if I could return the compliment, which what you do there at Holy Cross is invaluable. Thank you.